made up a fear-based story that they hate me, they've believed a perspective that has poisoned them against me, that I'll never again have a relationship with them. No weddings, no grandchildren. You can see where I can go with this. But none of that is fact. It's a story that my ego tells me to freak me out. The truth is, teenagers disconnect with their mothers all the time. I know I did. When I go into the law of acceptance and practice the idea that this is all for my highest good, and there could be any number of reasons for this lack of communication, not only do I feel better, but when I reach out to them, it's from a loving place of connection and curiosity rather than from panicked desperation. So I change the pressure in the situation. And I create a phase change in my attitude and relationship. As a matter of fact, I met them both yesterday for the first time in several months. But it was great. I don't need to believe my story about it. As we pull back and look at the big picture, we can separate the facts of the present situation from the story of blame or guilt about the past or the fear of what might happen in the future. We can open up to the possibility that things aren't always as they seem. As it turns out, my boys are just busy college students and chatting with mom isn't at the top of their priority list. <laughs> I just know there's nothing wrong here. Some of the tools that I use in my own inner work are the Fear to Faith or Radical Forgiveness Worksheet and the four inquiry questions of Byron Katie's The Work. I've made copies of those in case you're doing the same kind of inner work. and They're out on the table in the foyer. Doing this work gives me the opportunity to look at my story from a, a bigger perspective, a different perspective. As Marcel Proust said, the real voyage of discovery consists not in seeking new landscapes, but in having new eyes. I'm grateful for the tools in this teaching that help me broaden my perspective and freshen my eyes. The next law in Ford's book is the law of surrender. When we stop resisting and we surrender to the situation exact, exactly as it is, well, things do begin to change. Our resistance prevents us from seeing what is and what's possible. Letting go of resistance lets us just be in the presence of what is without any interpretation or illusion. We're then open to more options of seeing things differently. That's all right. <laughs> so without the presence of heat, how can I change this water into vapor? It's a question we can ask ourselves about our situation. Ask yourself if you're in a new situation, how can I be happy even in this situation? My mom is in a new situation. Over the past couple of months, her health has taken a pretty dramatic downturn, and she's being moved to an assisted living facility after living independently for 24 years. She is not a happy camper. And quite frankly, she's not particularly interested in listening to her Pollyanna daughters tell her to look at the bright side. As I watch her resistance and the pain and confusion that that causes, I'm reminded that I can't fix her or her situation and that everything is as it's supposed to be. I was at the Eugene Center for Spiritual Living last month and I walked their labyrinth asking the meditative question, what do I do about my mother? How can I support her? The answer that came to me was merely, be love. Whatever I do as her daughter, as her power of attorney, as her decision maker, I just have to remember to do from love. It's up to her to decide if she's going to surrender or resist, either in the immediate transition 
or in any other transition. We can say to ourselves, this isn't how I planned my life. It's not supposed to look this way. And it certainly is not supposed to feel this way. I never imagined that I'd have a broken family or my sons would exclude me from their lives. My mom didn't plan to have her driving privileges and her third floor apartment taken from her in the period of a month. Pain and disappointment are a natural part of life, but suffering is optional. Dr. Spencer Johnson in the book The Precious Present says, suffering is simply the difference between what is and what I want it to be. <laughs> suffering is simply the difference between what is and what I want it to be. <laughs> Releasing our attachments our, to our possessions, our relationships, our stories, that releases how we surrender. Detaching from our prescribed outcome allows us to align with the highest good of our souls. This, this surrender and faith in the universe creates a strength and resilience that brings peace and contentment at the core of our being. So what are you resisting? What are you clinging to? What are you afraid of? Ask yourself, what story have I told myself that limits my possibilities and obstructs my peace of mind? What's the worst that could happen? And if that happened, what would I need to do to be happy? As you question your beliefs, you may be able to broaden your view, change your mental atmosphere, and possibly shift your perspective. The next law is the law of divine guidance. First, know that you're not alone and that God will do for you what you cannot or will not do for yourself. Last October, I spoke about my journey inward and how my relationship with spirit has deepened significantly. While I want so much for my mother to enjoy a relationship with her source, that's not something she's open to at the moment, at least in a way that I can see. So I just continue to do my own work. That's what we do as practitioners. We do our own work. And know that God is at the center of all this activity. If you find yourself in a situation where you just can't see God anywhere, I hope you'll take advantage of our practitioners here to help you recognize the truth and recognize the blessings that may be invisible to you. The next law is the law of responsibility. With divine guidance, we can look at exactly how we participated in and co-created our situation, our drama. And we can make peace with the past. Debbie Ford teaches that your current situation is not the cause of your problems, but a symptom of all your unhealed emotional issues. Your pain and problems are rooted deeply within yourself. And you heal by taking ownership of your emotions. You can't heal what you won't feel. Stepping into the storm of uncomfortable emotions can be scary. Many people avoid or numb their pain rather than face it. I don't need therapy or prayer work. My family is broken or my doctor won't let me drive. That's the problem, not my inner wounds. OK, well, how's that working for you? <laughs> we need to be willing to heal from the inside out. Our toxic emotions fester inside us, making us fearful, tired, or sick. Or maybe we turn our unresolved anger into depression or powerlessness. We may say, I can't do anything about it. But what we're really saying is I won't do anything about it. 
acknowledging that regardless of the situation, the pain is my pain. And it's my responsibility, and mine alone, to deal with it. That's a step toward releasing it and healing. One of the tools in this book is to take inventory. In this case, it's a relationship inventory. How did I behave? What did I believe that helped create this situation? My mom stopped exercising, barely ate anything, and her reclusiveness reduced her social sphere. Her body got weaker and her clarity waned until she began to have falls that threatened her life. Is it her fault? No, but her actions, or inaction, did contribute to the situation. And taking responsibility for that part is the beginning of the healing solution. That brings us to the law of choice. Virginia Satir said, life is not the way it's supposed to be. It's the way it is. <laughs> the way you cope with it is what makes the difference. So having taken responsibility, we can then choose how we interpret our life's events. And our interpretations will either empower us or disempower us. We become the designer of our reality. An exercise in this book suggests writing a letter from our ex-spouse to ourself in order to open to their viewpoint. It's a way to imagine how things might look from a different perspective. Once you do that, you can choose whether to use this new information to beat yourself up or transform your life. It's important to recognize that you have a choice in how you view anything. Examine your interpretation and decide if it empowers you or drains your energy. My son's silence can either devastate me or I can trust that they no longer need my regular input. And it's time for me to start my next phase of life, however and wherever I'm led. So, I'm moving to Monterey, and I'm getting married with loving confidence and joyous anticipation. My mother's new home can either be a cause of sadness and withdrawal, or a celebration of new opportunity and of increased care and safety. Each interpretation we choose either adds to the quality of our life or takes away from it. Each negative event either opens our lives to new life-affirming opportunities or sends us into a bottomless pit of pain, suffering, and self-abuse. It's up to us. Our experience, our experiences set up our beliefs, and our beliefs set up our reality. Since we can't go back and change our experiences, if we want to change our reality and feel better, we have to change our thoughts and beliefs. Inside job. We can ask ourselves, what do I need to learn from this situation? How can this experience enrich my life? I've learned that I need to keep it light with my boys right now. They're not yet ready to embrace me or discuss any issues. OK. My mom may or may not choose to take better care of her body, to engage her mind by interacting with others, thereby enriching her life. She may see this gift of this phase change, or she may choose to feel victimized. It's her choice. A lot of our conclusions that keep about life that keep us stuck in a, is a state of entitlement. A lot of our conclusions that keep us stuck is because we come from the state of, of entitlement. It, if we see only what's been taken away or what we don't have anymore, we're engulfed in the smallness of our ego. Entitlement, which is a function of the ego, fills our minds with righteous indignation 
shutting down our appreciation for the gifts in every situation, even the yucky ones. Okay, the next law is the law of forgiveness, the big one. Forgiveness allows us to let go of our judgments and beliefs about what's right and what's wrong and find compassion for our entire self. Once we've received compassion for ourselves, we'll be able to find compassion and forgiveness for others. I'm learning to understand that my children came through me, but they don't belong to me. I did the best I could with what I had, and I know for certain that everything I did came from love. The fear of losing my children drains me of my energy and obstructs any hope for a future relationship. So that fear must be released. It's my choice. It's my work. I forgive myself. I forgive my children. I forgive my ex-spouse. There's no room in my life for blame, shame, guilt, or resentment. Perfect love casts out all fear. Finally, the law of creation. By experiencing the freedom of forgiveness, we open the gates to new realities. After taking inventory and responsibility for our beliefs and our lives, we can better see how to create on purpose. The universe teaches and guides us through the challenges of our lives and the choices we make in every moment, the perspective from which we choose to see will create our next adventure. Now that you know there's more than one way to do it, how will you choose to boil water the next time the need arises? <laughs> will the situation heat up or will you perhaps change the pressure? The choice is ours. It's always ours. And so it is. <laughs>